The influence a person can have over someone is profound, and in some cases, a single individual can be the subject of admiration for scores of different people. These admirers may use this influence to further their careers, to challenge themselves, to try new things, or even to improve their entire manner of thinking. However, what would you do if you discovered that a person you were close to had admirations towards people that could only be described as evil? And what would you do if you learned that your friend was idolising the type of person who normally occupied the nightmares of many, such as serial killers? Sarah M, known as Demina Cherry, had a highly questionable taste in people that she chose to idolise. And ultimately, her sick fantasies driven by her infatuation for these murderers would drive her to the coldest type of crime imaginable. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Demina Cherry. Now, I initially recorded this video over in Australia, but it looks like I didn't set the microphone up correctly. So let's give this another try. And just a side note, but I'm massively fighting jet lag here, so apologies if I'm a little bit abrupt. By the way, did you know that I post true crime and strange cases here weekly? So if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing to the channel, it really does help me out. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Demina Cherry. Willkommen back to Germany, folks. Our story today takes us to the southeastern state of Bavaria, and more specifically, to a small town named Forkheim. With a population of around 32,000 residents, this 1,200-year-old town may be small, but is brimming with ancient charm. With its name mistakenly believed to derive from Vorher, the German word for trout, you can find two on their coat of arms. Understandably, this is very confusing for many, and is a little bit fishy if you ask me. The town's general architecture is quite varied though, travelling in time from the Middle Ages to the 17th century influence of Baroque. Now, of course, we cannot possibly talk about Germany without mentioning their beer, and here in Forkheim, between the half-timbered houses, we can find the well-known Walk of Beer, which, perhaps more familiar, is the Germanic answer to the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Instead of celebrities, this particular landmark shows each star as a different brewery, which, by the way, sounds like one hell of a pub crawl. Pulling our thoughts away from beer gardens and back to the case today, we find ourselves in May of 2021, with a central figure of our case, 18-year-old Sarah. M. Now, unfortunately, very little is publicly known about Sarah, and even this name is a pseudoname. You see, Germany has an incredibly strict set of laws when it comes to data protection and to juvenile criminal law. This, of course, can make covering cases about, well, true crime very difficult. However, thankfully, we do have some smaller details available. Moving back to her childhood, Sarah was originally born in Switzerland, and was described as a troubled teen at best. While living with her mother, she encountered a lot of difficulties in school, and on several occasions, was in trouble with local officers. Unfortunately, her lack of respect didn't stop at school. She would often pick fights with police officers, and got in trouble after calling them various names. In the years leading up to May 2021, Sarah was admitted to an adolescent psychiatric ward on several occasions, all of which were were unfortunately against her will, and were due to her trying to take her own life. Although the length of each visit is unknown, she was eventually diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, and moving forward past this, several attempts to help her were made. Often confused with the different condition of bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, or BPD for short, is a dysregulation in mood stability. People living with BPD are often at the mercy of finding it extremely difficult to control their emotions, which can often be triggered to shift from one emotion to another for seemingly insignificant reasons. And sadly, victims of BPD experience a very high rate of self-harming tendencies. Now, Sarah found living with BPD to be extremely challenging, and the symptoms of the condition often proved to be hard to work past. As a means of coping with this, she eventually began to upload videos to YouTube where she openly talked about her struggles. I have depression, and indeed, I do harm myself. I don't recommend you doing it, by the way. And I know you ask yourself now, why do you do it then, and why shouldn't we? Well, honestly, I can't help myself. 
It helps calm me down, and it's like an addiction. As many of us know, living with any mental health condition can be both taxing and challenging. And to some, the burden of such conditions can prove to be a difficult one to carry. Now, fortunately, there are various forms of support that can make life with mental health conditions much easier. This ranging from therapy and medication, all the way to assisted living, or the support from friends and family. However, in Sarah's case, not much of that support was available, and furthermore, she didn't bother to seek it. And instead, at the tender age of 15, she turned to the world of drugs to cope. In the year of 2019, Sarah experimented with ecstasy for the first time. And around the same time frame, she found herself drawing both pentagrams and swastikas on her hand. Now, in Germany, for obvious reasons, it is a criminal offence to display a swastika, and being caught with one can be punishable by up to three years in jail. But this is not the only thing that Sarah was doing. Other petty crimes exist on a criminal record, and eventually, she would break the law in one of the most morally offensive manners possible. Around this time frame, she also had a boyfriend. However, nothing is actually known about him in terms of his name, age, or current whereabouts. We do know, though, that he was allegedly no stranger to the police either, and came complete with a criminal record. It was around the same time of experimenting with drugs that Sarah began to develop a fascination with true crime. Now, obviously, there isn't anything inherently wrong with that. If there was, you and I would be in big trouble. But when viewed with compassion, it can be both educational and cathartic. But for Sarah, her interest was not so innocent, and she became fascinated with American serial killers such as Ted Bundy and the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez. And alongside this fascination came a long list of dark ambitions that surely would be illegal to pursue. As many of you will know, Ramirez was infamous for his pentagram tattoo on his palm. He even left this symbol on the walls or even bodies of his multiple victims, often scrawling it with their own lipstick. And disturbingly, it seems that Sarah took this very inspiration from him. Her infatuation with this killer grew to very alarming levels, even going as far to having posters of him on her walls. It was in the month of April 2021 that Sarah reached her breaking point, and all of this would be caused by her boyfriend breaking up with her. The apparent betrayal devastated her, an unequivocal sadness manifested into anger, and alongside her inability to work through these emotions, a sinister plan emerged from the shadows. Soon after this, Sarah set up multiple profiles on different dating websites. This including the likes of Plenty of Fish, Badoo, Tinder, and so on. But Sarah was not looking for a partner or even a one-night stand. Instead, she was looking for victims. She was on the hunt for a man. Not for fun. Not for love but for murder. And her selection would be indiscriminatory too. And she soon decided that, no matter who he was, the first man that showed a significant interest in her would be her very first target. Going by the online name of Demina Cherry, Sarah quickly found a lot of attention on her. Describing herself as a bisexual virgin with a kink for BDSM, and adding seductive pictures of herself in lingerie, the attraction needs no real explanation. Saying that, a virgin who also loves BDSM sounds rather contrasting if you ask me. For those of you who've watched my videos for a while, you know I've covered several cases involving BDSM. The BD stands for bondage and domination, where SM seems to have various meanings. This includes slave and master, sadism and masochism, submission and sadomasochism, and many, many more. And you probably get the picture by now lots of kinky roleplay is involved. Anyway, BDSM is an entirely safe and enjoyable practice when done with the right person, and as you can probably guess, a large degree of trust is involved. Not something you'd get on a first date. But at least to some of these men, time with demeanor seemed to be worth ignoring these warning signs, and moving forward, several made contact with her. Over the course of the next few days, more than 240 matches are made with her profile, and demeanor would have serious conversations with three of them, even hinting at meeting up to have sex. You would be forgiven in assuming that maybe she was just looking for an outlet or a distraction from the breakup. It's surprisingly common to crave the validation of strangers in events such as this. And furthermore, the ego boost can be helpful in the healing. However, rebound was the last thing on Sarah's mind. Her post-breakup goal was not to find new validation. Instead, it was to become the world's most famous serial killer. 
Sickeningly, this very thought had been on her mind for quite some time, and now, with her boyfriend out the way, she was finally ready to commit to her evil ideas. With this in mind, she drove with a friend to a hardware store before buying a 12cm oakwood camping knife. Now, this friend had no idea of Sarah's intentions, and even helped her in buying the weapon when the cashier demanded ID. With the knife now in possession, Sarah's plan was finally in place, and the only thing left to do was to find a suitable victim. And on May the 1st, 2021, on the lonely site of Badu, her unfortunate target slid into her DMs. It was at this moment that a man named Zayed appeared in her messages. Zayed was a 39-year-old security guard who lived nearby in the city of Nuremberg, and in his message to Damina he wrote, Are you the Devil's Bride? Sarah texted back to say, Yes, the Devil's Bride herself. With apparent synergy, the newly matched pair began to initiate an intimate conversation after this, this resulting in Sarah suggesting they could meet the following evening for an encounter. I know a shed in the woods where we could have sex without being disturbed, she wrote. Zayed seemed to be very open to the idea. He would be finishing work by the time the evening came around, and so far had no other plans. That was, of course, until now. He therefore agreed to pick her up in his car, where he would then take her to the shed for an evening filled with passion. However, very little did Zayed know that these plans would be the last he would ever make. At 7.30pm, he messaged Sarah on WhatsApp to say, I am on my way. But after receiving this message, Sarah sent an alarming voice note to her friend, Francisca. I'm going outside now. This will be my first kill. I am super nervous about this. It is pouring with rain. Please wish me luck. After finishing this voice message, Sarah then sat down by her local bus stop, named Unterlein Leiter Freidhof. While waiting for Zayed to arrive, she began to make some very suspicious Google searches. This included places to put a person who is bleeding out, and what happens if you stab someone in the neck. Now, Francisca was very swift to answer Sarah's message. Filled with intrigue, she wrote, How do you plan on doing this without getting caught? It was quite obvious that Francisca wasn't taking Sarah seriously. Although saying that, she did Google what might happen to her if she failed to report conspiracy to a murder. Apparently, Sarah often made these sorts of outlandish claims, so it was never taken seriously. And to add to this, Francisca didn't believe that Sarah was actually capable of doing such a thing. Anyway, shortly after responding to Sarah, another voice note illuminated Francisca's screen. I am going to tell him, I have a surprise for you. Close your eyes. This was followed by the imitating sound of her cutting his throat. At around 8.20pm, Zayed had finally arrived at the bus stop, and after pulling up next to her, Sarah stepped into his car. The pair then drove off into the distance, but this would not be for long, as around five minutes later, Sarah asked him to pull over, to which Zayed complied. And at that moment, in a remote area near Ibermannstadt, and under no threat at all, Sarah stepped into the realm of the irreversible. Before Zayed even had a chance to ask Sarah what was up, she pulled out her camping knife, and with no hesitation or remorse, she plunged the blade deep into to his neck. After frantically forcing her hands off the knife, he stumbled out from the car, but sadly, the damage had already been done. With blood pouring from a large laceration to his jugular vein, Zayed's injuries were only fatal, and knowing that Zayed was now as good as dead, Sarah took her chance to flee. Losing blood at an alarming speed, Zayed was growing fainter by the minute, but despite this, was still able to walk to a nearby road before waving a car down for help. Two cars that were passing by managed to spot the desperately wounded man, and lucky for Zayed, a nurse was on board one of those vehicles. The emergency services were called immediately. Zayed was covered in blood, and apparently, all of those who were around him could see the fear in his eyes. It is a truly haunting thought to think what was going on in his mind as he lay there dying. Bleeding out has to be one of the most horrific ways to go. Zayed's rescuers did everything they could until the paramedics arrived, and once they did, he was then rushed off in an ambulance. Needless to say, it was clear that his injuries were life-threatening. While medical professionals fought for Zayed's life, Sarah had fled to Ebermannstadt Central Station. Those who spotted her were concerned, to say the least. She was walking around the station without any shoes, and more terrifyingly, was covered in blood. As she walked along in a trance-like state, people around her also noticed her repeatedly saying, I am a fucking killer. 
The authorities were alerted almost immediately, and only 30 minutes after attacking Zayed, Sarah was located and then arrested by officers. And due to her strange behaviour, she was then taken to the hospital for an assessment. While under supervision, Sarah said, I have just tried to kill someone. You know, it would be such a waste if I went to jail only for attempted murder. I had planned so much more. It is reported that she was both emotionless and abrupt throughout her interrogation. And when asked if her actions were in self-defense, Sarah replied with no. I wanted to slash his throat. I wanted to watch someone die. While all of this was unfolding, doctors and nurses were desperately fighting to save Zayed's life. As a result of his injuries, he had fallen into a coma along the way. And tragically, 19 days after the attack, he passed away in hospital. His final conscious moments alive were filled with fear, and his body's long fight with its injuries would ultimately be for nothing. As a result of his death, Sarah's charges were changed from attempted murder to murder in the first degree. And due to her abnormal behaviour, she was held in a psychiatric facility before being transported to Bamberg to begin her hearing. Moving to the legal proceedings of this case, her trial began in May 2022, and although Sarah's family and friends were present in the courtroom, they were undoubtedly not alone. Zayed's family had flown all the way from Iraq to witness her trial, with vengeful hope they would see justice served for their lost relative. Sarah's defence lawyers argued that, because she was only 18 at the time of the murder, she should only receive an eight-year sentence in a psychiatric prison, the maximum possible for a juvenile sentence. For the duration of her trial, Sarah was seemingly emotionless. She showed only reserved coldness to the courtroom, and, as you can likely imagine, this attitude won her no favour from the judge. During her trial, it was highlighted that Sarah suffered from a troubled upbringing, being faced with the likes of heavy school bullying, drug abuse, and even apparently a sexual assault from her ex-boyfriend. Her ex-boyfriend, who did attend the trial, denied that he had done any such thing towards Sarah. Though, whether this is true or not, we will never actually know. Anyway, none of this is any kind of excuse for the gruesome actions that Sarah had plotted and carried out. And hiding behind the mask of BPD does not make her any less of a cold-blooded killer. It is worth mentioning that millions of people suffer from borderline personality disorder, and almost all of them never harm another person. During her trial, several of Sarah's friends took to the stand. One said, It is unimaginable to me. That is not the Sarah I know. I only know her as a caring friend who puts others before herself. Another friend addressed the courtroom to say, We often talked about true crime, and she often posted pictures of Richard Ramirez to her Instagram story. Even still, I wasn't concerned. She once asked me for my opinion on Jack the Ripper, and that she thinks he was actually a woman and was therefore never caught. Another friend said, I wrote her a letter and asked her if the news of her crime really was true. She said yes. When I first heard about it, my initial thought was it was self-defense, and maybe the man might have tried to force himself on to her. The statements made by her friends confirmed that Sarah's actions were seemingly unpredictable. She appeared to be a normal young woman with no obvious signs for concern. And so the question is, how was she able to hide such a dark part of herself from others? In the end, Sarah was handed a meager 12-year sentence in a psychiatric prison, with an extension order should she fail to attend her mandated therapy sessions. At her sentencing, she refused to give a statement, and upon being led from the court after it was red. She raised her palm to show a pentagram symbol drawn onto her hand. Of course, a disturbing tribute to her idol, Richard Ramirez. Sarah's behaviour, both in court and in prison, shows a terrifying lack of remorse, without a shred of empathy for her victim or his family. She took a life purely for the thrill of the kill, and therefore had a high likelihood of striking again. Furthermore, it seems that, even after her sentencing, Sarah's position still hasn't changed. As of today, she has still failed to attend any of her mandated therapy sessions, therefore making it extremely likely she will serve additional time after her 12-year sentence is over. So we'll just have to wait and see if she will actually change her mind or not. Interesting side note, but there are currently around 500 people in detention facilities across Germany, and of these 502, only three of them are women, with Sarah now being the third. Now, Franziska was originally charged with failure to notify authorities of a crime, but this was eventually dropped. 
The judge determined that, due to her previous threats of violence, Francisca had no reason to believe Sarah. Francisca was lucky, to be honest, for had she been found guilty of this crime, she would have faced up to five years in prison. Now, honestly, I'm struggling to find the words here, but letters between Sarah and her mother contained requests for pictures of her idols. She wanted to put posters of both Bundy and Ramirez, amongst others, in her jail cell. Now, obviously, both the authorities and her mother rejected these requests, and it's clear from this alone that this woman has a very twisted soul. In addition to her little pentagram stunt in court, Sarah also admitted that her infatuation with Ramirez was stronger than any other feeling, and to add to this, she even wrote that he alone gives her total strength. Anyway, it seems that her time in prison hasn't actually been that taxing, as in all of her court appearances, she has arrived with freshly dyed red hair. It is reported that Sarah is both polite and unassuming to the officers and furthermore, hasn't expressed any desire to pick fights with any other prisoners. But despite her calm nature behind bars, her lack of remorse is very evident in the fact that she has still failed to attend any of her therapy sessions despite her mandate. The actions that Sarah chose to play out that dark night in May of 2021 has resulted in enormous consequences both for her and for Zayed's family. And although not much is known about the man, much like everyone else, Zayed had goals and dreams. With four months left on his visa, he planned to return to his home country of Iraq later that year, where he expressed his desire to find a wife, settle down, and eventually have kids. These desires were something both he and his family desperately wanted for him, and after being away from home for seven years, many of them were looking forward to catch up and learn of his many adventures. Now sadly, instead, his silence persists forever. After being contacted by reporters, Zayed's friends and family said the following, we won't remember him as that patient in a hospital bed who was connected to a ventilator. Instead, we will remember him for who he was, a loving and caring friend. He did everything for us. However, sadly, at the age of 39, his life was cut tragically short instead. And all of this was for the sick and sadistic pleasure of a young woman, who wanted to kill an innocent man, much like her idols killed before her. Anyway, folks, I'm wrapping this case up today. Thank you so much for being here for another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. I really do appreciate you being here. So, what do you think about Demina Cherry? Do you think she got the right punishment for her actions? Or do you think she should be behind bars for much longer? And again, apologies for the abruptness here. I am so freaking tired. For those of you who aren't aware, I just came back from Australia, as now I'm a permanent resident. But yeah, those flights, they are less than favourable. You spend around 22 hours in the sky, and after adding transit times, that's like 28, 29 hours travelling. So after all of it, it takes a good three or four days to recover. Anyway, thank you so much for your patience on this one. And again, thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. It really does help me and the channel out. I will be back again for another video very soon. But until that moment arrives, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you and goodbye.